So welcome to the Banner Bunch. Uh, this is our fifth Banner Bunch. Uh, when everyone raises their hands, it looks like most people have been to previous ones of these. Uh, we're having a lot of fun with these trainings and having this on. Uh, let's see if this is working. There we go. <laughs> uh, the normal introductions go into our training this month. We're doing faculty self-service. Uh, which is going to be really cool. And then it should take about 20 or so minutes and whatever time we have left over, it's open for questions for anybody that wants to ask a question. Uh, so today we've got a couple special guests, but we've got our usual team from the Applications and Systems Programming team. Uh, Kim Dan is here. Uh, Mark Harley. Harley. Why did I call Harley? Harley. Tyler Lafferty. Teresa Patterson. Lori is actually up today. Uh, Carl Rhodes is here. Lena is in the back because she wants to sneak out early. Uh, for myself, I'm Gabriel Williams and our, our fearless CIO, Michael. And then our special guest today, uh, we've got a registrar. Danny Means is here. He's going to sit up here with us. And Debbie Zeller, our, our subject matter expert on this. <laughs> So, like last training on employee self-service, I wanted to take a couple minutes real quick just to explain some of the acronyms we use, the language we use when we're talking about Banner, uh, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, Banner is a big database, and it, in general, databases are just a pile of spreadsheets that are all interconnected with tons of data and relationships inside them. Uh, but we've got two different interfaces that we can get that data on. Uh, we license a product from a company called Lucian called Banner, and it's got two different ways, and they're, they're very different look and feel and functionality wise. The one that many of you are probably used to is Banner, uh, Internet Native Banner. Let me find it here. There we go. So, this interface, you've all seen this interface before. <laughs> <laughs> this interface uh, is not the prettiest one, but it's got a lot of power behind the ugliness that it has. Uh, this <laughs> is <kind> of ugliness. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very unique to Banner. It's because this product is about 25, 30 years old. This is a bit of a legacy sort of interface. Uh, when you go into Internet Native Banner. You're going in because you're changing codes, or you're manipulating data, or you're moving information from one area to another. Uh, it's not always super useful. It's got a high learning curve to it. Uh, the one that more people are used to is what we call self-service banner. Or what you're probably used to calling it is web runner. WebRunner is not the Lucian product native to it. That's something we've branded here at Lynn Benton Community College. We call our Banner Self-Service WebRunner. Uh, Banner Self-Service is meant more for people that don't have any training on the system or, or have very specific needs on what they're going in to do. Uh, students use this a lot when they're going in for registration. Uh, we also have other products for employees to go in and look for W-2s or print off the pay stuff. Uh, the area that we're going to go into today is specifically around some of the functionality that faculty would use or advisors would use when they're doing their jobs. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that there's two different sides to Banner. When we talk about Banner, they're both Banner. One is Internet Native Banner, one is Self Service Banner or SSD. So when you hear us talk about student self service or faculty self service or employee self-service, that's what we're talking about. There's another tool called Web Tailor, but that's specific to the IT side of things on how you control and manipulate self-service data. So faculty and advisor self-service, we've had this for a little over a year now, uh, and it's an older elusive tool. Before we had faculty self-service, we had a system called Class Information and Grading. Who remembers that? Jerry's used that. We love that. Uh, Class information and grading was built here at the Benton Community College. So two programmers put that together years and years and years ago. Uh, it was very specific functionality to the way we do business here. 
Uh, but it came with one key disadvantage, and that because we built it here, we have to maintain it here. We have to support it, and every time banner changes, we have to change that as well and take time away from the team. Uh, that, that functionality may have been great, but it came at a huge cost. Uh, and especially where we're resource constrained like anywhere else, it was very impactful for this team. Uh, especially when Elucian has a product that's very similar. It might not have the exact same functionality, but it does a lot of the same things, or maybe it does the same things in a little bit different ways. This product, we don't have to do it. We just have to make sure that it's installed and still working. Uh, we do testing when things upgrade, but most of that is coming out of Elucian ready to go. Uh, we can configure it to meet some of our needs, so this functionality comes out of the box. Since we're paying for it, we might as well use it and uh, gain the efficiency through that. Uh, a lot of the things that class information gradient did, this does. Some class information gradient did better. Some factory self-service does better. But this is the product we're going to go with because this is the one that is a lower cost for the institution as a whole. So there's a lot of information here and on the next slide. I'm going to actually go out to factory self-service and we'll just walk through all of it for this training. So we've set up some fake data in our development instance, and that's what I'm going to be using. So hopefully we don't run into any real data, but if we do, we're covered by her, her, uh, and I'll change it when we get to the, the YouTube channel. All right, so this person is a faculty member so they have this faculty advisory tab. Everybody has the personal information tab. This person's also a student and employee, so they have those pieces of self-service as well. And in fact, the advisor, we're just going to go through all of these links just kind of one at a time, no particular real order. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. But we should be able to go through these pretty quick. If I have any questions, I'm going to ask Danny. This advising menu has a whole other list like this. We'll come back to that at the very end. So term selection and CRM selection, those two links in here really drive the functionality for the rest of this. You choose a fall term, fall information is going to come up for the rest of it. If you choose a specific CRM, that information is going to come up through. You don't really have to go in these because the rest of these links will prompt you for term and CRM as they need it, but I'm going to show you them anyways. Term right now in self service, we have fall, winter, and spring set up. Uh, when summer becomes available, it will appear here as well. I believe the registrar's office controls that, don't you? Visibility. Right, the visibility of which terms are in here. So if you wanted to look at fall term, you could choose that. And it just brings you back here because it knows that you want to look at fall information. If you choose CRN, these are specific to the CRNs for this person for fall. So this person. In the fall, taught these three classes. And in these menus, you can see the CRN. You can also see how many students are in those classes. If we hadn't chosen term before we came here, term would have come up. And then we would go to choose our CRN. And again, it brings us back here because it thinks we know we've chosen what we want. And then we can go that way. If we went to any of these other links without choosing those first, it would prompt, prompt us for a term and then prompt us for a CRN. We need to run across that occasionally. Or I may come back out and choose different terms or series that are showing you different things in here. Back to the detailed schedule shows a lot of information about the courses for this term. So remember, we chose fall term. These are all the classes that this person was teaching in the fall. And so for this math one fit or math 015, you can see that it's an active course last fall when registration was open for it. What college it was in, which department, how many course credits were available for it, what campus it was on. There's a lot of info here. You can also see how many people are enrolled or how many students are still available. Uh, if there was a wait list set up for this, you'd also see that down here. And you can see when the class is being held. There's a lot of information kind of crammed into this one line, but you can see what dates the class is being held, what day of the week, what time of the day, who was teaching that course. As we go through self-service, you're going to occasionally notice this little uh, email icon. If you ever click on that icon and where you're at, you're going to end up emailing that person. It'll pop up whatever your default email is. Uh, I don't have one set up on here. But it would bring up the email address for John Faculty Smith or whoever we're clicking. 
And I'll bring that to your attention as you kind of run across it. Two things you've probably never used here, and I don't know if it's really that useful, but you can also add a syllabus here for a class. Uh, I think if we were using more of the banner baseline catalog, this would be more important because it would automatically put that into the catalog. Uh, and registration, you can put in basic information, just text into this. Return. There's also office hours. This is a little more useful than you think. Uh, most of the time you just include that in your syllabus or you communicate it to the first day of class. Uh, when students are registering for classes or when they're in student self-service, they can actually go look at your office hours after they're set up in Banner. I don't know how many people actually use that, but you do have that ability to set that up in here. You can set up what days of the week, from and when. You can actually set up a contact number. Uh, and even day ranges if you're in different areas at different times during the term. Uh, if you had previous uh, office hours set up on different schedules or different courses, you could actually go out and choose to copy that course and put it out there. So all the information for this person for fall is, is right here in the faculty detail schedule. I do want to go back and show you a different term though. If I were to choose, say, spring, it's mid. I can go back to our faculty detail schedule. These are all the spring courses for this faculty member. The one thing I wanted to show you to pay attention to is that if a class is being canceled, you'll be able to see that out here as well. Uh, it's not really intuitive across a lot of faculty self service whether or not the course is being canceled or not. We're working on different ways we can display that or control that. But right now, this is one great place to go to see if that class is being canceled. So it's right up there at the top. Status that first. Another way to look at your schedule is that on a calendar. So we, there's a week at a glance capability here. Well, it defaults to today's date, and for this date, it's winter term, and this person has these courses for winter term set up. You can go and put a different date in here and it'll pull up that week, or you can just navigate week by week. So if you go to next week, Next week is uh, spring break, so this person has no courses. The week after that is spring. And you can see the courses that they have. Uh, something that's important is these courses with time conflict. A little small and slow at the bottom, but if you notice that you have a time conflict, these two courses are at the same time of the day. Uh, that's something you want to talk to academic affairs about immediately, or, or maybe Danny. Uh, because you're scheduled for two courses at the exact same time, you don't want that to happen. Will this show your office hours too? On here? Mm -hmm. So you can click on any of these and go into them, and it'll bring this up. Uh, I don't know if your office hours actually show in here, but you can get back to them through that office hour menu uh, right here. You can add that information at each time here. <laughs> we haven't tested if it would pop up here, though. Like if we added office hours, yeah. that would it show on your Oh, screen. I see. You're asking if it would show up in the calendar. Yeah. I don't know. It show up on Let's go find out. We're a little off script, but that's okay. So if, uh, if we put it in between the Eight and nine on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Here's my contact number. Uh, our, our office is CC110. Put that on there. And you need to put a front end in two days. So, 2016 to 2016. There's a little display uh, checkbox here. Let's check that as well. So if I go back to that week at a glance, uh, it does not. Now, didn't it go on spring? Well, I put a date range on there from March 1st to April 1st. And it's not going to be. Well, this is March 14th right here. Right, but it was sitting on. So it's hard to tell me if they really. Right. 
And if people are using a lot of this functionality, sometimes there might be a little bit of setup that we don't know about. So we can always look into whether or not that's even a possibility or it just doesn't show up here. So now we're going to look at our class list. Uh, these are probably one of the more useful pieces here. There's a detail list for class and wait lists, and then there's a summary list, and they both behave kind of similarly. So if we go into our detailed class list, you can see information on each student in the class. You can see if there's a wait list for the class, this person's ID, their level, their the term they were admitted, how many credits they're taking the class for. Uh, do they show you who the waitlist at first is? Yep, we'll get to that in the waitlist. Right now we're looking at people that are actually in the course. Uh, there's an email button. Like you said, if you click this button, you'll be emailing test persons. And every person in the class is going to show up in here with all their information. Uh, another thing that you can do in here is you can click on any of these. And you're going to get into the student information. You can look at their addresses. You can look at their email addresses. You can look at other classes that they're taking and whatnot. The other way to look at your class list is the summary class list. And I think this one's a little more useful depending on what you're looking for. This one takes all that information and puts it in a little bit more of a summary format so you can see everything that's everybody that's in the class at once. Uh, again, you can click on their information and go directly to them. You can email them. Uh, there's another cool feature down at the bottom where you can email everybody in the class at once. Click on this, it'll bring up your email uh, provider browser. And everybody's email address will occur in the BCC line. So it's going to blind copy everybody at once. So one student won't see the other person's email address. You can also enter final grades here. But that's going to take us to another part of that for self service that we'll get to in a minute. So Kimmy was asking about the wait list. This is where you would see the wait list. You can see all the people that are currently waiting for this course. And for this, right now, we have a maximum of five, but there's one person that's actually waiting, this person right here. And so the course is only allows 19 people. As that becomes available, this person will move off the wait list to this course. And we have room for another four people on that wait list. Again, you can click on this person's information. You can email them. You can also email all the people on the wait list at the same time. And like the class list, there's also a summary version where you can see all of them stacked up together. Uh, the number of credits they're taking, their IDs, all that information. So the next one is final grades. And it's going to be open for whatever uh, course we're looking at, whether or not the, the course is open. Uh, that's, that didn't come out quite clear. Uh, if grading is open for the course, you're going to be able to see the ability to change information on there. If we went back and looked at one for fall, where grading is no longer available, you would see that these people have already got grades, and it is rolled to academic history already, yes or no. Uh, you can also see last date attended, uh, the registration number. One thing that's a little different here is that it only displays 25 at a time. So if there's more than 25 students, be aware that there's another list here that you can click on and go look at the rest of them. So let's actually go grade somebody. Uh, right now, that's kind of uh, relevant, pertinent information since we're getting a little close to the end of winter term. Let's go in and grade a few people. So for this course, it's a pass, no pass class. If it was an A through F class, all of those would show up as well. Uh, you can choose whatever grade these people have earned. You can put incompletes. You can choose that they have audited the course. And at the very bottom, you would submit the grades. I did this on purpose. Yes. If last day of attendance is required for the specific grade that you're given, it's going to prompt you. Yes, put that in there. So last day of attendance, if you're tracking attendance in your course, you know what the last day of attendance is. Uh, 
uh, if you don't know what the last date of attendance is, or they never showed up, then you would put the first date of the term. And that's something that the registrar's office is going to track and take care of. Uh, I believe the class information grading is putting the word never. That's not going to work here because we certainly vote it that way. Uh, so our default is to put in the first date of the term. Uh, so for this one, it was uh, 05, I believe. It has to be the first date that that class was failed. So if classes started on the 4th, but that's a Wednesday class, you're going to have to put Wednesday state. Right. That's very correct because this class started on Tuesday, so it's the, the fifth. The first day of the term is the fourth. So you want to know what day that term started, or that class started. Again, you can always go back to this information and it'll tell you what the date range on that class was. So let's submit this one with the last date of attendance. So one of those I had actually put an incomplete grade on. Uh, I don't know if this is for every incomplete grade, but some in incomplete grades will ask you. What is going to be their final grade if they never do complete this course? And you can choose either pass, no pass, uh, whatever the business process is for that course. Let me choose to not pass this person if they never finish the class, they're always incomplete. Then this rolls to academic history and they not pass. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, just a couple of things to know about that might pop up as you use it. Class A, the tenants, or the incomplete courses, incomplete grades. So, Dave, yes. on the um, last day attended, there were only two, um, two that had the error message. Mm -hmm. Does everybody in the class, do you need a um, last day attended for every one of you, or just the ones that are kind of grade? It depends on how those courses are, are set it's, up. It's set up by grade. It's set up by grade. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the student, that's why the grade that you choose. This is more uh, federal compliant than our old system. Really? Okay. Yeah. So because of federal compliance, this is the right way to do it. Uh, incomplete grades, not passing grades, they want to know the last two of attendance. Uh, if it was an A through F, are there certain ones that yes. an F grade would require the last of attendance and non a non complete? And, and if faculty are working on this, they can make changes um, until the grade rolls, so it rolls every night. So there's no option to save it until later, later in the week. If they submit something, it's going to roll to history that night. True. So this is different than before, because before you had to have all your grades there before they would actually roll as a class. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and not yeah. roll, but come in as a class, mm -hmm. and then there was a roll process that happened each night. Mm -hmm. And now they, whatever grade they put in is submitted once they have, If they have one submitted, that one will roll tonight. Once it's submitted, then they can't, they are no longer able to change it. But during really busy times, like probably Thursday and Friday, I'll do a roll sometimes every couple of hours because I want to see where we're at, who hasn't submitted their grades, who's mm -hmm. missing, so I can start going to that division and saying, Laura, <laughs> we are missing you. So, what if they have submitted, it's been rolled, are they supposed to contact you at this point then? For grade changes? For grade changes. Yes. Yeah, they have to email the CRM, the student's name, ID number, and the to and from grade. Okay. Correct. So I'll, I'll repeat that just to make sure that that was captured on the audio. If after, after grades have rolled, uh, in faculty self-service, you no longer have the option to change a grade. So you need to change a grade after they've rolled. You need to contact the registrar's office. Uh, another thing that came up in there is when you can put these grades in. It's really however long the, the grading is open for that course. If you notice when I first came in here, I was on spring term, and I could already start putting grades on those courses if I wanted to. Uh, it's really this will close. What day do we roll grades? Is it the Monday after finals week? It rolls all the time. Technically, they're due on Friday. In Friday at 5 o'clock. They're due Friday at 5 o'clock. Sometimes we go past that. Right. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so for this, we've submitted these grades. Uh, we put in a default for the incomplete, and that's all based on how that, that grade in that course is set up. 
Uh, you can also go to an incomplete grade summary and see all the incompletes that you have hanging out there. Uh, and you can change the default incomplete grade here as well. Uh, something I didn't bring up on the previous screen, but there was a warning also that after 90 minutes, starting on this date, uh, there's a time limit on this page. So it'll time out if you just leave this page open all day. Eventually, it'll stop saving. So you want to make sure that you're saving and submitting and refreshing this page on a regular basis during these, these time frames. All right. We're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, registration overrides are available. So as an instructor, you can give certain students an override for a class. So for the class that I'm in right now, this uh, HD 120, or no, this is the student schedule, I'm sorry. For this instructor, for this person, I can go in and choose a reason to override for a specific class for registration. Did I say that correctly? Does that make sense? Yes. And you can put in multiple reasons. You can override that prerequisite at the same time for that same course. You can choose a different course and say, I also want this person in 212 even though we're at capacity. And if you're familiar with SFAS RPO, this populates that screen. So it gives the student permission to register. It does not register the student. And then it'll also show up in the student's registration status. So if the student says, um, Professor Smith has said that they give me um, an override for a prerequisite for Math 251, they can see that in their registration status on their web runner account. That's handy. Mm -hmm. So you have the ability to give registration overrides through self-service. Uh, and then you can also see your advisees lists. Now this is winter, so this list of advisees don't have any grades out there right now. But we can go back to fall and look at all of our advisees for fall and what courses they took and what grades they got. Uh, we're not currently grabbing midterm grades, uh, but if final grades had enrolled in academic history yet, they would appear here in this column. All these are in academic history, so they all appear in that last column. So it's a good way to keep up on all the students you're advising. You can look at a grade summary for a specific course uh, at any time. And we will look at these grades have been rolled to academic history. If last day attendance was filled in, you would see that here as well. Something that I didn't mention earlier, though, is that uh, there is a C in the CRN selection, you have the ability to also enter CRNs for other courses. So for fall term, say I wanted to go look at a Spanish course. Um, yeah, right. yeah, so a big loss in class information and grading is the ability to go out and find any class roster for any class. And uh, so this is the baseline feature. Um, and part of that is like, for like federal compliance and FERPA. That wasn't a good practice to give any staff member the ability to look up any class list. Mm -hmm. and so that's why Banner is tighter than our old system. Right. And Banner will prevent you from seeing the grades for those courses. You can still see the students that are in them. Uh, this one, I was in faculty grade summary. I went and chose a class for fall uh, by CRN 2000-20030. It's a Spanish course. This instructor doesn't teach that Spanish course, so they can't go in and look at the academic history for all the students that are in that course. But you can go and see who is in it if you go to the summary class list. You can see all the students that were in there. You can communicate with them, but you don't have access to those final grades because of FERPA. Like Andy just said. scroll down just to, to the end. And so, if if this was a current, if this was a winter term class and a final was canceled, this is where you could go to email the class and say that it had, it had moved or it had been canceled, or if a faculty member wasn't was sick, like you could uh, you had access to email. Mm -hmm. There's one more piece to this that we haven't rolled out system-wide called faculty feedback. Uh, for spring term, this is going to be in a pilot with a couple of math classes. So this is a pretty cool functionality that we're excited about. In here, 
you can provide feedback on students and courses. Uh, it's, it's divided up by sessions or basically time periods when you can get feedback. Uh, we're exploring what different times during a term might make sense for giving feedback on students. Uh, right now we're looking at, does it make sense to see who's attending that first week? Uh, we go in and check on grades and midterms or how people are doing. Uh, right now I think this is set up for second week, fourth week, sixth week, but this may change once it's rolled out to everybody in production. But we did want to show this to you. Um, so if this, if the student, if the math instructor is not the student's advisor, can the student's advisor see um, their list of classes and then see some of those comments? So no. they can help a, a, a student? Not yet. That's further down the road with when we get to uh, Banner 9 and some of the features that come with it. With the advising profile, um, and things start coming together. And right now, we're getting a little ahead of the features that are coming with Banner Nine, and trying to figure out what sort of information we want to gather through this. Right now, this is like I said, set up through a pilot phase where we're just kind of seeing what information makes sense to gather, and if once we've gathered it, what we do with that information. Uh, does it make sense to use this on this campus? Does it not? Uh, that's why we're only using uh, maybe two or three math classes in the spring, and then you'll hear more about this come summer. In here, though, you can expand these little lists, and we can choose what sort of issues apply to students. Right now, we've got it set up for attendance, or students missing tests, or they're, they're failing their work. But you can also have some stock recommendations for students. Uh, right now, it's not set up for it. There's a text box where you can type in information, type in free form, whatever you need. You can also put in a, an estimated grade. If that person's failing at the third week and you don't think there's any way they can turn it around, you can put that information as well. Right now, just the registrar's office. Again, yeah, that's another one of those things that we're exploring. Who, does, who needs to see that information? What can we do with that information? Right, right now with math, there's for those three issues, there's things that they want to have happen based on the end of the second week, end of the fourth week, and end of the sixth week. And the first end of the second week, there's going to be focus on calling students about attendance, and then fourth and sixth week is the same, but there's also going to be calls and appointments scheduled with the learning center. Mm -hmm. There's also the ability you can see that faculty feedback status is optional on all of these students. Uh, if we find that this is highly successful and that there's a population of students that really would benefit from this, we can require it to make it mandatory for certain students. But once it's submitted, you can tell that it's it's bolded here. You can see that. You can see an estimated grade. You can go back and look at it at a later date or even change it as long as that session is open. One other thing that going through all of these that I didn't mention is that at the bottom of a lot of these, oh, let's go to one that I can get to. Uh, if I go to, let's choose a term and Sierra that I can get to because we were still looking at Spanish. The bottom of a lot of these, there's links. I think go somewhere where I can show you that. Links to other areas so you can navigate within all the sections. You don't always have to go back to the menu back and forth. Uh, some of these don't make sense, like midterm grades. You don't get midterm grades, so it's just going to tell you that midterm grades are unavailable. But some make sense where you can go back to the term selection or faculty detail schedule and kind of bounce around. Anything that's blue is a link, so you can kind of click around and dive through and really explore all the different ways that this information is connected. So now that we've covered all those, let's go into the advising menu. Uh, again, there's different ways to select people or, or specific information here. You can go by term, you can put in a specific ID. Uh, if you put in an ID for someone that you're not advising, they can give you a message saying you don't advise the students. You can go see a list of all your students that you advise, their information, another place where you can email them or email all the students that you're advising. You. Uh, and you can dive through to different information like their student information or their holds. Their alternate pin shows up here as well in the registry. It's very useful. 
Again, you can see their information. You just dive in. It's just like clicking on their on their uh, link here. You can see their citizenship, their major, a few other pieces that we haven't seen anywhere else. You see their address and phone. We've already seen that. We can see their email addresses. Uh, we can do registration overrides here as well. We can go look at their academic transcript. Uh, one thing to note here, we can divide it up by levels, but levels are basically credit courses. That's your only option. So might as well just say all, all levels. Uh, we don't have this set up to display an official transcript. So if we click on that, we're not going to get anything. It's just going to say it's not available. So what, the, what you really want is that transcript at the bottom. And then you can go look at courses that came in from other schools, what are their coursework looks like, their GPA would show up at the bottom of this. You can divide it up by credit, totals, courses, and progress, that sort of thing. We've got a couple of links that head out of Leg Runner, so you can go to Degree Runner. Click on that and that'll take you out of the system. It's a little beyond the scope of this training, but it's good to know that it's there. You can look at all the registrations that a student has currently, and this will show everything that a current student is currently registered for. Right now it shows winter, and then down at the bottom it'll go into spring. So you can see everything they're registered for. You can view their test scores. So this person's taken a couple of placements for their tests. You can see the scores that they got on those and when they took them. You can also see if they have any holds. Uh, this person does not, but if they had any holds, like a financial hold or registration hold, those would show up here as well. And then similar to the, the fact the detail schedule and weekly glance, we also have their registration available here. This is information that they would see if they were in student self-service, but you can see it the same way that they do. You can see their schedule for uh, what term are we looking at. This is spring term, when the courses start and end, how many credits they are, what time they're at. You can also look at it on a calendar again. Let's see what their schedule looks like. You can even put this off if they don't have it already. And at the very bottom of this, at the very end, is a link to advisor track. Similar to Degree Runner, it takes you outside of Web Runner. Uh, it's outside the scope of this training, but that's where you can get to it. You don't have a directive already. All right. So that is everything in Faculty Advisor Self-Service. It took about half an hour to walk through all that, so we don't have a whole lot of time for questions. But I'd like to open it up to you guys now. What sort of questions do you have? And they don't have to be related to Faculty Advisor Self-Service. You can ask them if you want. You have the entire team at your table and Danny. <laughs> you like it? Do you have a question? Yes. And I do like it. Okay. Um, but I have a question, and it's maybe for you, maybe for Sally over there, and it's just out of curiosity. Um, yep. So I know that there are going to be indicators in the catalog now of which courses have um, low cost textbooks or low cost um, course materials. Mm. Who enters that, and where does it show up? So, so I need to. to Amend that just a little bit. It's okay. not going to be in the catalog, it will be in the schedule of classes. Um, and what we're set up to do, although we don't have the information, we haven't received the information yet from those who would provide us with that, and we're not sure who that is. Um, in, when you're in the schedule of classes right now, if you click on the CRN, you get a little series of symbols. There will be a symbol, like, I think it says, I think it might say OER, it might be exactly what it is. Developed, and that would be on that section of that course. So that section of writing 121, or that section of math model, or whatever course it is, has the low cost textbook. At this point, what we're trying to figure out is how that information would be uh, relayed 
to our office so that we can get it into schedule classes, and that's a little bit of a chunk. Because I haven't quite resolved all the pieces, but not catalog schedule. Okay. So, you said you click on the CRN little box shows up that you talked about in the footnote area. You're going to have this go with them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no. Go ahead, Daddy. So in that, that section is footnotes, and it looks like it's pulling from all these different places. And so that will change over time as we move to the baseline. Because this, like our use of the class schedule isn't baseline either. Right. So we'll have to address that. When we yeah. How, however we address all the other footnotes. Yeah. It'll, because we have to move that section up. We can move on the course level. Right, right. Um, so however, we'll address other types of footnotes that are course, that are section specific. Mm -hmm. This would be one that we would want to be okay. section specific. Well, the footnotes are section specific. Right. Already. Right. But I'm just saying, as long as we get a baseline, stay on that path. Well, and the whole goal is to get the students to the, the correct bookstore information or, or information on where they can get the books. Correct. No. Right. Am I saying the same thing? No. The goal in this kind of instance is to alert the students that this is a, a section of a class, a time of opportunity for low cost. Textbook yeah. material or text materials, mm -hmm. um, which is a little bit different than what you described. Right now, by law, we are required to get the student information on the cost of textbook required which directs them to the bookstore. And That's what I'm thinking about. That information. So, this yeah. is before they even hit the bookstore, they're alerted up front. These are the sections, but this particular mm -hmm. section has OERs. Does that answer your question? Yes. yes. Where, 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 where. All right. Other questions? When we took away class information and grading, probably one of the biggest things that we've heard of was uh, to say, well, how do I get my class list? I, I used to hit the export button in class information and grading and I get a, an Excel spreadsheet and I was able to do that on that. Uh, is that something that's still valuable that people want to do? Is there ways to do that with this, or we have other ways to do that, uh, get that functionality to you? I can show you a couple ways that that could be done. So one of the, the simplest is just to come into class information and grading, and you can just copy and paste this into yourself. That's simple. So there's no export button, but it's very simple to do that. The copy answer to that is these little icons for email don't really copy and paste very nicely, but they're easily taken care of in Excel. And modify the report SWRC LLS to mm -hmm. add a column for email, and it can also uh, populate a CSV file so it can be exported to Excel. Correct. There's, there's, there's a banner job that we have as well that you can run SWRC LLS. It'll export this class list. It has an email address on it and a little bit different information for the students. Uh, and it can come out in a CSV or a text file. So that's, that's also useful. Any other questions or feedback we have? I'm glad you like it. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of functionality that's in here that's also currently turned off. If you went out to the Illusion Hub or FR Band Docs and started reading all the user guides on faculty self-service, we don't have everything turned on right now, but that's something that we're moving towards is utilizing more of the functionality that comes from Illusion uh, instead of building our own. In fact, you'll hear more and more in the near future about back to baseline. Uh, similar to class information and rating, we're, we're trying to take away all these mods that we have in Banner and start utilizing Banner the way that it's intended. Uh, partly that's for our team because we're so resource constrained, but it's also because there's a lot of cool functionality out there that we just have turned off because we've never had the time to turn it on or, or figure out how to use Banner in a, in a more basic fashion. Some of that's going to change the look and feel of Banner, and we'll address that as it's coming. Uh, some of that's going to prepare us for getting Banner XZ, the next version of Banner, turned on, which looks really cool, by the way. Uh, looks like it's from this century. Uh, part of that's so that we can get other tools like DegreeWorks installed, which currently we won't be able to because we're so heavily modified it wouldn't work if we installed it. 
So yeah, we've got other things that are out on the horizon that we'd like to use, but it's, it's going to require some time and some development, but we're heading in that direction. I'll just tell you why I like it. Why do you like it? So before, when you were entering final grades, you, it was terrifying because you knew you could go back and change it without like getting in touch with everybody. And if you just like click the wrong place, you're just like mm -hmm. too many people to get X instead of A. And now that you can go back and change it, it's a lot less terrifying of an experience. They tell it rolls in history. Okay. Until it becomes academic history. Yeah. So you have less control of that now because before you couldn't, it wouldn't submit until everybody in that class had a grade selected. So as long as you still had one person in that class you hadn't graded, you could go back in and back in and back in and back in. And now, once you hit that submit button, once you've got a couple in there and hit the submit button, those three go over. And when Gabby does a roll or it happens at night, you can't get back to it. Okay. Even though you haven't done everybody in the class, but you can still go back to the same class. Yes, right. yes, yes. But you can't go back to the same person in G. All right. So the, one of the cool things here is you can do one at a time. You don't yeah, have to do all of them at once and hit submit. You can do one at a time as you get them ready. Uh, you can just log in and log out, however it works out for you. Uh, I think that's really cool. I also like that it does a little bit of data integrity for us. It tells us when we need to put in that last bit of time rather than just randomly hitting them or doing it for everybody or, or whatnot. Actually, it used to do that before all of us. It only gave you a box for people that were financially oh, yeah. And then if the bad grade came up, mm -hmm. it would give you that area. Yeah. And that was the part where we were out of compliance. Because it didn't grab the people why the box. Why don't they need to I know. <laughs> I think so we've gone through our questions. Uh, it's about five minutes to the end of the hour. So uh, we're always open for questions. You can always send us an email. This email address here at Banner Support Groups emails the entire team, uh, including Michael, including Lena. Uh, use that email address heavily. Uh, we're, we're really enjoying seeing what everybody's working on and communicating outside the group. You can send it to us 24 7. Uh, this bit.ly address here is also a shortcut to our YouTube address. Uh, we've partnered with LBCC Media to record these and make them available. The employee self service training I gave last month was available out there as well. Uh, I know that the time of this, the time of date right now wasn't very conducive for a lot of faculty to make it to us. So we're gonna share this address with everybody. Uh, we're also available if we want to give this training again at any time. Just let us know. That'd be happy to come out and we run through the slides, we run through faculty self-service and have another conversation. We really enjoy doing this. All right. Thank you very much.